Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. I'm your host, Heather McFadden, and this is the place where I get to walk alongside you and connect you with people and resources so you know that you don't mom alone. And in this episode, number 409, I'm welcoming back to the show, Kristen Hatton. She didn't see my struggle with sin. And so I now realize as parents, we have to go first. We have to be like, I talk a lot about living redemptively. What does that look like? We need to confess our sin, ask our children for forgiveness for our sin, let them in on our struggles. And I have people ask, well, but if I tell them this, then they might think it's okay. I said, no, what they're seeing is that mom and dad need Jesus. Kristen was first on the show in March of 2016. Y'all, my boys were four, six, eight, and 10 back then. And she was giving me advice on conversations and how to interact with my boys then for the teen years. And that's what we're talking about today. Again, she has a new book called Parenting Ahead. And in it, she's helping parents with these exact things. How do we walk with our kids redemptively through parenting? Not focused on outward success or what the world would say is a successful child, perfect behavior and all of the things. But how are we demonstrating the gospel in these everyday moments? How are we sharing our own hard things with them and our need for Jesus? And how do we stay connected with them through those elementary and young years so that we have a voice in their lives as teens? It's always great to talk to Kristen. She is a true in real life mentor to me. She's walked with me through some hard things even in the last year, and I'm super thankful for her. So let's get right to it. Here we go. Kristen, welcome back to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you and to actually like do real life with you now. Well, I know. Welcome to Dallas too, right? Thank you. I know. We, I mean, we had so many overlapping friends. And then the Lord just has assigned y'all to be back here and as empty nesters. And I love it. It's really fun that like now I'm looking at you, but like I can sit and have coffee with you. Yes. whenever. And we have, and we have, and we have book babies launching within days of each other. We're doing a book signing together. I just love that I have mentors in my life, real people. And I'm always telling people, Yes, listen to this show, but I want you to have women in your life, even if they're your same age, but their kids are a little bit older, that are helping you because I have straight up grabbed your face and said, help, (laughs) like I need wisdom (laughs) right now on this specific issue and I don't know who else to go to and you were so gracious to help me because this parenting thing is no joke. It is no joke. And I appreciated that you felt like you could come to me and I have those people too. And I still, all these years later, I mean, young adult parenting, it never gets easier. Like we're always a parent. We're always a parent and you can't say one stage is harder and you can't stay one child is, I mean, it's just, you need people in your real life who you can take your real issue in the moment to. Absolutely. And give you perspective. And that's what I love about what you've even written in this book is it's like the perspective of you have grown children and these are the things you've seen that mattered and what didn't matter. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And the steadfastness. Yeah. The steadfastness. Like you said, the perspective of just, it's hard to see outside of our here and now. Mm -hmm. How old are your kids right now? So my daughter is married. She's going on 25. Her husband's turning 30 this week, which is crazy to me that that's how old my son-in-law is. Well, when you marry up, I married up. I get that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did too, actually. Um, My boys are in college, 21 and 19. And you're, I mean, your youngest is just two years older than my, my oldest, but I really do feel like you've gone through stages I haven't gone through. And I think that what you're saying, the faithfulness, because I I will be honest, I will have gotten to the point in the last couple of years where I've just thrown my hands up at times and said, none of it mattered. Nothing I did in these little years that I put on the podcast that I said, do these things didn't matter. And your voice to say it did. (laughs) It It comes back around. I mean, in the mundane of 
of the disciplining and the diapering and just, you know, the shepherding their hearts, it gets exhausting. I know it feels like, is this worth it? They're going to just be teens. And, and that's what I see all the time is, te- is parents of teenagers throw their hands up and they're like, forget it. I'm done. Well, because you are like, to me, it was easier to be faithful in those little years when their hearts were tender and they were responsive and we could have sweet conversations about God's word or about like, you know, how to make a different choice. And they were interested in what I'm just saying. <laughs> then now when you see some of the choices or just the life my kids are not horrible children. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they become their own people. And you question, did any of it stick? And you do get discouraged and you're like, it's too much work. I don't think any of that mattered. Just to love them and care for them and just let everything else go. But you have gotten even to the other side. And I've heard parents say this when they get to be sophomores in college, (laughs) maybe married, and they appreciate possibly the childhood you gave them and the direction you gave them. That is the absolute truth. In fact, my daughter, when she got to college and realized that she had friends that thought she was lucky that she had a curfew, it was like a whole new perspective to her. It was a game changer. She thanked us. And that was something that we butt heads on all throughout her high school. Okay. So I'm curious. Yeah. Why would, why would their friends say they were thankful? Well, they saw their parent, they wondered if their parent really loved and cared about him. It because huh. why would they not protect me? Why would they not want to make sure that I was home, you know, at a reasonable time? Why were they throwing the drinking parties? Were they more concerned about being the cool parent than, you know, shepherding my heart, caring about the my soul? Um, but I think mostly just the safety issue. Like, why were they not like making sure hmm. that I was home? Why were they just going to bed and letting me stay out till whatever time I chose? That's really interesting. It's like, it feels a little bit like in parenting, no matter what we do, they're going to have some critique. Yeah. You know, right. <laughs> like you're, you're permissive and that was wrong and you're too structured and that was wrong. Like, it, like free us up. Like we're not going to get this a hundred percent right. We never will get it a hundred percent right. No, I mean, there's no perfect parent. And so I wish that I could free everybody from even striving for that. Mm -hmm. And really kind of back to what you were saying that, yes, it matters what we do. Absolutely. It matters what we do in the early years. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy in the older years, but we are planting seeds and we are creating that foundation. However, God is the sanctifier. And that is my hope as I've watched my children struggle and deal with different things to remember that he is over their sanctification and he's using them, their sanctification in my sanctification process. And it's his timing and in his timing. And sometimes through a lot of trials and struggles is what he uses to bring them more to himself. And that sanctifying is this big word that's just us becoming more like Christ, this process of the Holy Spirit working in us through life. I mean, I was even writing in my journal yesterday, things that I would like the Holy Spirit to refine me in that I said, bring to mind, you know, bring to mind. And oh my goodness, did he ever. There are plenty of things that I need sanctifying in before I turn all my attention on how my kids need to be better. Right. 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 And if that's our focus, I mean, really, I want my children more than anything, anything to know that they need Jesus. And so that changes my focus too. And even Mm -hmm. it changes my focus and my hope when they encounter difficult things, because if I can believe that God loves my children more than I do, and that he's using all things for their good, then sometimes he has to take us through those trials and the fires to bring us to that place. And so it's, it's freed me. I mean, the difference between the parent I was first with my first child to my third child is so different because I now am able to better rest in God's sovereignty and his sanctifying work and not freak out or try to control as much as I used to. And believe me, I used to a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. My daughter thought I was the biggest nag there ever was. Yeah. I mean, the white knuckling, because if the goal is you need to look good now, not you need to look good by the, you know, over the course of your lifetime, not even look good. You need to, from the inside out, be transformed. Then 
it cha- does change our focus in our interactions. And I think our interactions with our child, and like you said, being the nag, you know, how do we, I talked in with uh, a few different guests, but one of the topics we talked about with my book is staying in your hoop. Like how do we, mm-hmm. in this journey, as our kids' hoops are so overlapped with our own, do that process of, like you said, keeping in mind God's doing something bigger. What other things helped you to not be that nag with your daughter? Yeah. So, I mean, I realized and set the same concept as the hoop is I was stepping into her bubble. Yeah. And so I learned like, if she wasn't inviting me into her bubble, then I needed to stay outside. And if she failed, then that was her own learning opportunity. And so I just needed to let it happen how it may. And I think that's why we nag, right? We want to ensure that they get it all done. They get it all right, that they don't suffer some consequences. But I finally got to a place where I'm like, okay, like this is, this is her problem. This is her thing. And so I just have to <laughs> trust that God is going to teach her and grow her in it. And like, what age is that? Because I think there's still like the little, little years we're still in their bubble. Sure. We don't wait necessarily, but like, when did you see that differentiation and separation for your kids? Uh, definitely the teen years, but I think it's progressive. I mean, there starts mm-hmm. to be things, even when they're in elementary school that we don't need to do for them. And so the sooner we start age appropriately, letting them do what they can do for themselves, the easier it gets when they're teenagers to I mean, not totally release our hands from everything, but if we've been doing it all along, it's a little bit easier to let them be in charge of their schedule, their schoolwork. I don't need to micromanage all these different things. I'm not going to be there in college. And I'll tell you that what it made her feel, my nagging, is she felt like she could not do life without me. And I think that's what Mm. we're seeing statistically with all the college age, young adult kids who are struggling. They haven't developed their own self-efficacy. They were so used to parents jumping in and taking care of things for them that they just kind of fall apart under the stress and um, they just don't know how to handle it. So she really felt that. And she was able to verbalize that to me that it seemed that I didn't, that she was equipped. And that was so far from the truth, but I realized how that, how that made her feel that way. Hmm. That's a really interesting way to think about. I could see like some people, some kids, Hey, I got this. And they're just annoyed. But to get that message that, oh, no, you're saying I'm not capable Mm -hmm. to do this on my own is really an interesting thing to consider as parents. It's like, where could you take a step back? And whether your child is eight, nine, 10, like what is something you could empower them? Because I think the message we get sometimes is a good mom does for her kids. (laughs) Uh A good mom makes lunches for her kids. A good mom, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. It feels like you're being a great parent by doing. And in our intention, like we're well-intentioned, you know, we want to serve. We're told as believers to, to serve others, to put others first. And, and so there is that fine line of, okay, what can I do to serve and help them? And where is that actually not the most loving thing to do by doing this for them? One challenging area of parenting always consistently is sleep. Whether you have babies and toddlers that you aren't sure if they're going to sleep through the night or you're just trying to get your elementary school kids in bed. I am so thankful to now know, I wish I'd had it when my kids were little, I must admit, but y'all with the technology get all these advantages. Um, It's the new and improved second generation hatch rest. It makes sleep better and more magical for your entire family. The all-in-one hatch rest is a smart sleep device with a sound machine and a nightlight that grows with your kids. So with your babies, you can set whatever sounds they would like, whether it's white noise and lullabies to soothe them to sleep, or toddlers. There are different colors and sound cues. You can have a time for bed pairing. So I set this up on the schedule for during the week, during the school week, when they need to be going to bed. And honestly, even in the summer, we're going to need to have a little bit of help with this. And then for 
helping them wake up in the morning so they can do it more on their own, it's going to change color and have a time to rise signal like birds or you can you can pick and choose through the app what you want. So you can schedule it through the app, the exact time you want them to wake up or go to bed, and then the color you want it to be on the hatch rest and the sound you want it to play. If you have a child who likes to get out of bed earlier than you'd prefer, we had this, we would say, don't get out of bed till the clock says 700. We had a little sign next to it. Well, times have advanced and now it will have a like a yellow color on the nightlight to say, okay, it's about to be time to rise. And then when it's time to rise, you can make it be green. This device, the rest, has helped over 3 million babies and parents get restful sleep. It is no wonder that it's consistently a top baby registry item. So right now, Hatch is offering our listeners up to 15% off your purchase of a Hatch Rest and free shipping at hatch.co forward slash DMA. So if you're ready for improved sleep for your kids and yourself, go to hatch.co forward slash DMA to get up to 15% off and free shipping. That's hatch.co forward slash DMA. And even in the hard things, like I know that you've shared even in our previous episode about your daughter's walk through an eating disorder, Uh how do you shepherd a child through something really challenging and yet also give them the message that they're capable? Yeah, um, I learned so much through that. And one huge thing I realized kind of towards the latter journey in that that might have been after that prior episode was she thought I was perfect. And that was part of her struggle is she felt like she didn't measure up. And as a counselor, I see that all the time in the counseling room is these kids, whether it's pressure internally or externally, often it's both. uh, They just feel like they can't measure up in all Mm -hmm. the ways that they need to academically, athletically, appearance wise. And so she helped me understand that I was not letting her in on my struggles that even though I knew I wasn't perfect and I didn't realize that that's what I was doing, she didn't see my struggle with sin. Mm -hmm. And so I now realize as parents, we have to go first. We have to be like, I talk a lot about living redemptively. What does that look like? We need to confess our sin ask our children for forgiveness for our sin, let them in on our struggles. And I have people ask, well, but if I tell them this, then they might think it's okay. I said, no, what they're seeing is that mom and dad need Jesus, but she wasn't seeing that from me. No, I was privately doing that, but somehow I was just like keeping her from that. And she needed to know that my mom struggles. She doesn't have it all together. Uh, No, that's a really good word. Like recognizing, Hey guys, how I just responded. I don't, I don't respond like that. That wasn't loving or kind. And will you forgive me? And admitting that, I just think that's such a huge gift to our kids. And I don't, I mean, again, in the counseling room, I see kids who come in and say, I see the imperfections in my parents. I mean, the older our kids get, they see it. But if we're just sweeping it under the rug or we're self-justifying it or um, just getting onto them about their stuff without acknowledging our own, it makes us unsafe. They do not want to talk to us mm-hmm. and um, and they feel like we're hypocrites, which yeah. we are. If we don't live redemptively, if we're not the ones setting that pattern in our household. Oh man, that's a good word. Okay. So another thing, an aspect of this with parenting ahead is you even talk to the value of doing this alongside other people. I mean, that's what Don't Mom Alone is about. Talk to us about that and how do we navigate when it can be negative? You like where again we get outside of our our get into other people's bubbles, other moms' bubbles. Like how do we <laughs> parent alongside each other for the future without causing hurt and pain and overdoing mm. it, overstepping. Overstepping. And and doesn't that go back to the idol of control. Somehow yeah. we we make other people's problems our problems or we insert ourselves unnecessarily. And we can be so judgmental of other people's decisions too and not really knowing the full stories. Mm. So and do you think too it's like this insecurity on our end? We're like, we don't really know what we're doing. And it's like, oh well, they definitely did it wrong. 
Like, it makes and it makes feel us feel a little bit better, yeah, right? Feel better, yeah. I mean, that's totally. what I've always told my kids: is why do people, you know, talk bad about someone? They want to elevate themselves, like pull you down, elevate themselves. And and we moms are no different. Is we can we feel so insecure, and we see what we think we see is everybody else has it all together, and they're doing it all perfectly. And and so if then there's someone that's not, we kind of feel maybe a little relief that like, okay, maybe I'm not so bad or I'm not as bad as them. Oh man. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I've been convicted of this. Like if we say, if I say something about another family or another parent or another kid, I've been called out from my kids and saying, well, you say you're friends with them, but then you talk bad about them. It's that hypocritical thing. Yeah. They notice. And I would say, that is something too, that makes us unsafe because if they Mm. hear us saying something about one of their friends, even if it's just an acquaintance or their family, then in their minds, they're thinking, well, what is, what would she think about me if she knew this, or what would she think about this close friend if she knew this? And so they kind of tuck it away and they're like, Oop, I got to be careful. I can't let mom know this. Totally. I was thinking that if you hear something, some a choice some child has made or some path some child's gone on and you have some diatribe on how wrong it is and you can't believe it, and then your child goes on that path, there is no way they're telling you. No way. And how many times have I eaten my words because we kind of think, oh, my child would never do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've mm-hmm. learned. Don't ever say that. <laughs> what if there's like a friendship debacle between your kids and another kid? What is our role in that as we're parenting ahead? Like, how do we, how do we empower our kids, but also navigate it with them? Right. And probably depends somewhat on their ages, but I definitely think it's best to equip our children to know how to enter in and handle things because that's part of their growing and learning. And so Mm -hmm. we talk through it with them and then encourage them to have redemptive conversations with friends. Mm -hmm. Um, That's how they learn to enter into those kind of relationships where we can Mm. confess, ask for forgiveness, give grace, move past something. But instead, so often, what do we see? We jump in and we try to control and we could do it for our kids. It's not helping them feel equipped. So it may start in training, like a peacemaking process of, Hey, when you did this, I felt this, or I'm sorry, I did this kind of like an ownership of their part. Yeah. And a communication of what went wrong and like an attempt to repair. Yes. On their own. Yes. And when I've seen that happen, in fact, my daughter, that's happened with a couple of her friends where I think it's so tempting to just abandon the friendship because mm-hmm. it's hard to do that kind of work because we don't want to be vulnerable enough to say, please forgive me for X, Y, Z. But when we can take ownership of our part and give grace, because what is grace? Grace is giving um, like goodness to the guilty. Like we're covering over it. We are, we're absorbing the hurt and not holding it against them. Yeah. And so to, to do that just by God's grace, are we able to do that? But how sweet when friendships and relationships can move past that because of that extending grace and forgiveness to one another. Well, and it's, it's a grace bank of, you know, when you need it in the future, it's like, okay, we have set a relationship of we make mistakes and we forgive each other and we move on. Like there's not what you were talking about earlier, this need to be perfect or this need to get every interaction right, which is so much pressure. But I feel safe in this friendship to make mistakes and to be forgiven and to be that kind of friend. Like you will you will attract those kinds of friends if you are that, that kind of friend. Yes, and even the implication we're talking about parenting ahead. What do we do now that impacts later? Even thinking about our children's future marriages. I mean, Mm. when we are helping them learn how to do that kind of relationship, we're setting them up to be able to engage in the marriage relationship, which is a constant needing to repent and forgive and give grace. Yeah. Is hiring challenging? Yes. Do you love a challenge? Also, yes. You need a hiring partner that can help you rise to the challenge. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. 
instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's powerful hiring platform can help you do it all. They streamline hiring with powerful tools that help you find matched candidates. With Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes it so easy because everything's right there. You can invite a candidate to apply and they are three times more likely to apply to your job than those who just see it in a search. You can also get closer with their immediately matching you with the quality candidates. They do all the hard work for you. Even better, Indeed is the only job site where you pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Only the ones that meet your must-have requirements. Indeed is an unbelievably powerful hiring platform, delivering four times more hires than other job sites. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash DMA. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash DMA. Indeed dot com slash DMA terms and conditions apply. And if you need a hire, you need indeed. No matter what stage of parenting you're in, I know that sometimes getting makeup on is maybe a low priority, but it can make you feel a little bit better about your day. Well, one thing that if I've just washed my face and put on moisturizer, I will always put on is my Thrive Cosmetics mascara because it changes everything. And I love that this mascara, if you have never tried it, y'all, total fave. It has more than 25,000 five-star reviews for a reason because it looks like lash extensions, but it's not damaging your lashes. It's actually forming a tube around each lash that when you wear it, it doesn't clump or smudge or flake but it's super easy to come off when you need it to. It just slides off with warm water and a washcloth. You don't have to use a heavy soap or scrub or anything, so your lashes aren't breaking. It also has nourishing ingredients that support longer, stronger, healthier-looking lashes over time. And Thrive Cosmetics are certified 100% vegan and cruelty-free beauty products. They also have no parabens, sulfates, or phthalates and they're not compromising their performance. Like I said, it's a great product. So you get clean, great beauty products with Thrive Cosmetics. Not only that, they have a bigger than beauty promise. Every time you purchase something, cause is in their name for a reason because they support organizations that help communities thrive, like those who are battling domestic abuse, homelessness, cancer, and so many more. So if you have to try Thrive Cosmetics, to see for yourself. Right now, you can go get an exclusive 20% off your first order when you visit thrivecosmetics.com forward slash DMA. That's Thrive Cosmetics, and it's spelled out C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash DMA for 20% off your first order. So if you are going to have a parent of like five-year-old, seven-year-old, nine-year-old in front of you, and you were going to say, this is what matters most. You have said parenting redemptively, communicating. We all make mistakes. We need to meet each other at the foot of the cross, get forgiveness. What other things have you found that mattered now that you have adult or almost adult children? Yes. Intentional connection is huge. I think in our busy, busy lives, we might be with our children, but we're not actually connecting with them. I would say slowing down and protecting that family time, being intentional about our family time, being intentional about our one-on-one time. I have clients that come in and they say, my parents go with me to all these soccer tournaments and I'm with them in the car and this and that, but I don't feel like we ever have time together. Mm. Um, it's just a rushing about and not, I mean, just 10 minutes a day of intentional. And I know I've been so guilty of multitasking where I'm on my laptop, half listening, not really, really paying attention to what my kids are saying. So intentional connection, active listening, paying attention to their nonverbals. I know we miss so much when we 
don't see the expression on their face or see their arms crossed or notice what they're not saying. There's been Mm -hmm. times that what my kid has said to me is not really what they're saying. We have to kind of read behind, you know, beneath the lines, um, which takes really paying attention. We want to be safe people, which means Mm -hmm. we have to be willing to not be shocked. We have to talk about the taboo topics and all of this takes place in the normal everyday life. What I see though, is we're running around again. We're not doing life at home together. So often it's like this kid is there and this other kid is there. And, and there's no real great solution to that because I know, you know, I have nothing wrong with activities. My kids are all in activities and sports, but we have to then find a way in our home that works with us where we are saying no to maybe good things just because we have a, an open Saturday doesn't mean that our kid necessarily needs to go hang out with their friends. That might be when we say, no, we want this for our family time because those kind of unrushed, um, unscripted conversations happen when we are together yeah. without a plan. Yeah. And we just don't have enough of those anymore. Yeah. And I could guess, you know, I know your sons were in football. Yep. And one of them played in college or both. He ended up not playing, but he was considering. This is what I'm saying. Sports have their place and they do a great job teaching teamwork and persistence. And so I'm all about team sports and all that jazz at the same time, the balance of recognizing this relationship with your child is forever, hopefully. And the sport may not be, yeah. or the activity may not be. I think they're like holding in the balance. What is necessary to help my child have identity and like, like help them your identity and worth comes in Christ. But I'm saying like, there's aspects of some activities that are helpful in relationships and feeling a sense of belonging significance. But if we overdo to the side of a different goal, we miss out on what you're saying actually matters, which is the connection, the listening. And some people can do the connection and the active listening while doing the activities. But I know for me, it's not an option. I know my own personality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like the family dinner table is not happening so much anymore. And that's really, I think so important. And I get, we can't do that every single night. We didn't do it every single night, but, but if we're not doing it at all, then something is out of whack in terms of our values and -hmm. the friends are going to come and go. That's, this is another thing is I, you know, kids can go be with their friends, but their siblings are also forever. And so it was so important to me to foster that sibling bonding time, which meant sometimes I said no to other friends because already they're going their different ways. They're in different grades, especially when my daughter was, you know, it seemed much older than her brothers than it actually is because she was already in a teenage stage and they weren't. So that was the last thing she wanted to do. And yet her brothers are forever. I mean, now she's been out of college even for three years. And so there's just a few friends from high school, a few friends, friends from college that stick, but our siblings are forever, but we need fostering that in our home while they are all in our home. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's this, again, it's like, they may not be best friends, but they are, they're forever friends. And I found even when my dad passed away, like they were my support. We were the ones doing all the things. And I was so thankful for them, even though I have a sister who's 16 years older and a brother who's 11 years older, there is connection from intentional times. My parents, the rhythm you talk in your book about getting these family rhythms and routines. And I think if anything's thinking about that, just making time again, these aren't formulas, right? This is unique to your family. But if we, if we just follow the waves of culture and what everyone else is doing, then we look up and they're teens and we've realized, oh my goodness, this wasn't what I wanted at all. This wasn't mm-hmm. the path that mattered to me. It mattered right. to maybe this friend or to this, to that. It wasn't what I wanted. 
Well, and we get so caught up ourselves as parents, like wanting them with the right group or being on the right team. And and it becomes so much of our identity that you're right. We kind of get swept up without realizing that this really isn't the direction I want to go. And I think very easily we get to their junior, senior year of high school and we start thinking, oh my gosh, I barely have any time left. Have I said everything I need to say? Have we, has this child learned everything I want them to learn? And we kind of, at least I had kind of a panic moment, like the end is here. And yet we have all this time, but we're so often just not intentional, proactive with it. Yeah. And I, and I said, like, this is not what I want. I think too, it's really thinking about how is, how has God wired my child? And there's this dialoguing with God on asking him because there have been times I've made illogical pathway decisions in my parenting that were God led that didn't make sense. And I can see now why God directed us there for that child. And mm-hmm. so really being a student of your child, really asking God for direction specific to them. Do we need to do this activity? Do we not? Or do we need to go to this school? Or do we need a homeschool for this year? Or other things that honestly, only God knows the whole future. I remember a mom, she heard some guests say something like that. And she felt God telling her to um, stay home, like to change her job situation. And I think it was right before COVID and she just could see his hand. Um, And then something happened with one of her children who became very ill. And she was just like, God knew ahead what was in my path. And I'm so thankful that I listened to him and followed. So yeah, parenting ahead sometimes is like, connect with the guy who's already up there. (laughs) You know, he's already ahead. He's outside of time. He knows everything that you're going to encounter and he's not surprised. So Right. And like you said, each of our children are different and they have different needs and there's never like getting it or arriving at some place in parenting because they're all different and have different needs and different situations and personalities. Yeah. Oh man. Kristen, thank you for being with me. Thank you for having me. Where can they connect with you? What What's the website? We'll put a link in the show notes to that. Um, Redemptive Parent on Instagram and my website is just my name, kristenhatton.com and my books are available on Amazon. kristenhatton.com, Redemptive Parenting on Instagram. Thank you so much. I will see you very soon. Yes. Looking sounds forward great. To it. Thank you, Heather. Okay. Thanks y'all for listening. I hope you can check out Kristen's book, Parenting Ahead. She is a fantastic gal and I'm really thankful for her. I'm going to pray over us and this whole concept in our parenting. Lord, I thank you that you have entrusted us with this role. I also thank you for the reminder that whoever is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And that that's a reminder as moms that we are not creating our kids. We model, we disciple through showing them our own journey with you, God, But ultimately, you are the one who's recreating them, remaking them. They are in you and not in us. And I pray, Lord, that you would release whatever mom is listening that is feeling the burden that she has ruined her kids, that she has messed up to this point, that you would help her spend time with you and to hear truth about how you made her and how you are remaking her kids and how there is nothing too far beyond your reach of redemption and restoration. And Lord, I pray that a spirit of encouragement would fall on her, God, that you would lift her from a place of feeling failure and that she would hear your voice and your love over her. I thank you and praise you, Lord, for all that you do in our lives, for your spirit's leading, for your son's death and resurrection and all that you're doing to remake us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you guys for joining me again. Remember, every Tuesday, I send you a note. And in it, I hope to encourage you with what God's teaching me. I also share the week's episode in the show notes and anything else related to that. Whatever I'm loving, um, different places that I've been able to share 
and podcasts and all the things. So if you want to sign up for that and get that note from me, just go to olaheather.com. Ola is with an H like Heather, H-O-L-A, heather.com. I'd love to connect with you that way. Otherwise, I will see you back here next week. Have a good one. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Don't Mom Alone podcast. If you're wanting to connect with more people and more resources to help remind you that you're not alone, head over to don'tmomalone.com. That's where you'll also find show notes with any links mentioned by our guests. Most importantly, I want you to know the good news, the great news that you're not alone because God has promised to always be with you. With faith in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and rose again, Jesus said when he left, he was going to leave a helper, a comforter to be with us. God in us. Moms, that's superpower. So while you're washing dishes at your kitchen sink, while you're driving to and from work, while you're feeding that baby late into the night, while you're cleaning sticky floors, God promises to be just as present with you as when you're worshiping in a church pew. As it says in Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. Now that's good news. Have a great day.